Hi there, welcome. I'm Mark Thomas. Thanks so much for coming along and joining me as we spend a little bit of time considering what God would say to us today. We do that as we read the Bible and consider its message for us. So why don't we start with a short prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us and we thank you for your word for us today. We pray that you would give us attentive hearts and minds, ears open to your voice speaking to us, hearts willing to respond. So gracious God, would you bless us by your presence now and may the glory go to Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Today I have the great pleasure of inviting you to welcome and listen to a friend. A friend who has been to Mount Pleasant in the past. His name is Ed Kaneen. Ed, or the Reverend Dr. Ed Kaneen, if you want to give him his formal title, is a Baptist minister and he is co-principal of the South Wales Baptist College. Now he and his wife and daughter live in Cardiff and they're members of Ararat Baptist Church. Now Ed and I see each other from time to time in our respective roles at the college and I know how much his teaching both at the college and the university and also his preaching in local churches is so appreciated. Now it's a little over two years ago uh, since Ed last visited Mount Pleasant and even if you don't know him or recognise him from that time I'm quite sure that you'll warm to him. So in terms of inviting uh, him to join us today it's my pleasure to do so and I'm quite sure that the blessing will be ours as we listen to Ed. Now you might like to have a Bible with you as Ed speaks to us. He's going to be speaking from Psalm 145. But I'll let Ed introduce that. So over to you, Ed. Shamai, hello. It's a pleasure to join you for worship today. But it's such a shame that we can't yet meet in person, but I hope we will be in worship together someday soon. My daughter, Sarah, is now going to read to us from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name for ever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and praise your name for ever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall lord your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendour of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed, and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Thank you, Sarah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word revealed in Jesus. We thank you for those who have recorded the scriptures who have preserved the scriptures, who have translated the scriptures and who teach the scriptures to us. We ask that your words might sink deep within us, that we might know you better and live for you in this world. Amen. Like so many of us, I have spent more time than I care to remember in online meetings over recent months. 
It's just not the same. And though I used to complain about them, I now long for face-to-face -face meetings. But one of the most irritating things about the online meetings, and this happens so often, is when someone builds up to saying something important and then their image freezes on the screen and you can no longer hear what they are saying. I find it so frustrating. But you'd think a person very strange if they didn't find it frustrating, if they were somehow satisfied with the fixed image and the incomplete words. Yet I fear that we can be like that in our picture of God. I mean, maybe our picture of God is still the image we were taught as children. Or maybe it's the picture of God we discovered when we came to faith. Or perhaps it's the picture of God that a significant minister preached on regularly. It's not that any of the Im images are bad or wrong, but there's so much more. For our students at college, hopefully they leave with more knowledge of theology and better skills in ministry and fuller awareness of God's purposes for the church in the times past, present and future. But frankly, if they don't leave with a greater vision of God, then I think that they and we have been not using our time well. In an online meeting, a frozen face is frustrating because we can't hear what the person was going to say. But in our relationship with God, a frozen picture of God, it risks us being unable to hear the new and wonderful things that God would say to us because we are binding God's words to the limits of our vision. That's why I love the Psalms, because whether the words are soaring to the heights of faith or sinking to the depths of despair at the troubles of life, they are honestly seeking more of God. They're holding God uh, to what they and others have experienced so far, but they're also eagerly looking forward to what God will next reveal. I think of the writers of the Psalms as the researchers of the Bible, the investigators, and their research topic is God. They want to look into their own lives to discern more of God's activity, and they want to mine God's word to understand more of God's will, and they want to pray and worship to encounter more of God's very person. And Psalm 145 is one of the fruits of the psalmist's research. It's, if you like, a PhD thesis on God, and a cleverly written one at that. A few minutes ago, we made up some alphabetical prayers of praise, and that's exactly what happens in this psalm. Each verse begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It piles up phrase upon phrase, describing the greatness of God. In the synagogue, they used to say or sing this psalm three times a day. I just wonder what difference it would make to us if we did the same. Because in this one psalm of merely 21 verses, we have people who extol, bless, praise, Lord, declare, proclaim, all, sing, speak, tell, and make known the goodness and the glory of the Lord. And we find out that God is to be praised for his greatness, works, mighty acts, majesty, terrible deeds, abundant goodness, righteousness, mercy, steadfast love, compassion, glory, power, kingdom, faithfulness, and upholding. He raises the bowed down, is bountiful, just, kind, he hears, saves, and preserves those who love him, and destroys wickedness. Wow as well as the stepping stones of the alphabet, uh, that kind of lead us ever closer to God. There's also an ever-expanding pool of praise, because it goes from the people of Israel in verses 4 to 7 to all creatures, and then literally to all the children of men, as it were, in verses 10 to 12. In other words, everyone. This is a vision of God, not just for the believer, but for all the world, the whole, everybody and everything that benefits from God's goodness and grace. And in particular, as a result of the psalmist's research, he makes five declarations about God in this psalm, each beginning, the Lord is. And the first is, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. Actually, these are God's own words, taken from uh, the time when Moses went up the mountain to meet with God and received the Ten Commandments. Uh, and you might remember, Moses at that time prayed a very simple prayer in Exodus 33. He said to God, now show me your glory. And the result is one of the most quoted verses in the Old Testament. It says, he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. I find it wonderful, mind-blowing really, 
that what God regards as his glory is not his almighty power or his all-seeing knowledge, but it's the fact that he's compassionate and gracious. I mean, this is not a God who sits resplendent and removed. This is a God who is moved by situations that he sees. He's moved by your situation and mine. Then the second statement is that the Lord is good to all. Sometimes as Christians, we can be frankly arrogant and assume that God prefers us to everybody else, that God would rather be in church with us on a Sunday than with those who are shopping in Morrison's or on the rugby field. The Bible is full of stories of God reaching out to the outsider. Jesus says, sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. The Lord is good to all even to those who deny him, even to those who turn their backs on his ways. Then the third statement is the Lord is faithful. This verse is missing in the King James Version, but without it, we'd have lost something uh, really precious. Who of us haven't been let down by somebody else? But God keeps his promises. That's part of who he is. And as if to drive home the point, the psalmist goes straight on to say in verse 14, the Lord upholds all those who are falling and lifts up all those who are bowed down. What a wonderful promise. Are you falling? Have you fallen? God will uphold you if you let him. Are you bowed down? Perhaps with the pressure of lockdown or circumstances, health, God will lift you up if you ask him. God's power of his promise is there to revive lost hope and failed abilities and missed opportunities. Then the next statement is that the Lord is just. God is not fickle like the gods of the nations around who upheld the values one minute and then dropped them the next. These gods were like human beings because they were inconsistent. But the God of Israel, the God of the psalmist, is consistent in how he deals with the world. Our God is fair. Our God will not let evil triumph or hate win, for he always seeks that which is right and true. Just this week, Rosa and I had some racial justice training. And it would have made you weep to hear some of the stories that black people have faced here in Britain in our days. The pain that many black Christians have experienced is not just outside but it's also inside the church i'm saddened and shocked to say but as i listen to my black christian brothers and sisters i hear them holding on to the truth that the lord is just and then the final statement definitely not the least but it is the last is that the lord is near. Most of the human beings, the celebrities that were invited to worship through films or on TV are people who are far away, people we'll never meet and never get the chance to develop a relationship with, we'll never have the opportunity to find out if they're really as attractive or impressive as they appear to be. But not so with God. The Lord is near. The Lord is near to you today and we can know this God. Hallelujah! Five statements of faith. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. The Lord is good to all. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is just. The Lord is near. Is that your picture of God? Wow, how amazing. Yet God is still more than this and reveals himself more and more as we seek him. But you know, this is not the kind of research that is just put on the shelf and forgotten about. The research of the psalmist and our seeking God, it makes a practical difference. Because I think that the psalmist offers these words to be repeated day by day in worship, not just to shape our vision of God, but to shape how we live in the world today. Where God is gracious and compassionate, that we might be gracious and compassionate. Where God is good to all, that we might be good to all. Where God is faithful, that we might be faithful. Where God is just, that we might be just that the God who is near might be seen in us, near to all people. I remember J. John telling a story about a service he attended 
a service in which the preacher began the sermon by saying, God is. God is loving. God is compassionate. God is holy. God is awesome. God is merciful. A bit like my minister uh, who died last year. He went on and on and on. And after 36 minutes of God is, God is, God is, he paused and he simply said, and if that God lives in you, surely someone should notice. Thanks so much, Ed, for opening our eyes and stretching our minds and expanding our hearts and inspiring us to worship God and demonstrate through our actions uh, who he is and what he means to us. If you want to drop me a line uh, in response to anything that Ed has said, please do so. I'd be more than happy to pass it on to him. Before I go, uh, perhaps you'd like to join me in saying what we call the grace together. And if you're not sure of the words, uh, I'll make sure that they're up on the screen for you to see. So just follow along. So we say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. 